All right, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Jean Househair, and I'm the president of the Oklahoma State Medical Association. Thank you all for coming. Oklahoma health care is undergoing a seismic shift due to the recent passage of State Question 788. Today, we stand together as leaders of the Oklahoma health care community, imploring the Board of Health to recall that first and foremost, it remains their focused responsibility to protect the public health of all Oklahomans as their core mission. As the Oklahoma State Department of Health continues the rulemaking process for medical marijuana, we would like to remind those involved in drafting these rules that their decisions will substantially impact public health and the house of medicine for years to come. We must get this right from the beginning. The beginning starts now. Medical professionals are required to carry the responsibility of initiating this process for all Oklahomans who seek medical marijuana. It therefore only makes sense that we have input into how this is accomplished. This law is very specific to medical marijuana and the use of medical marijuana as a treatment for medical conditions where patients may benefit from its use. In fact, the state question was very specific to this point and we want to make sure that the final rules ensure the medical nature of this new law. Historically, we acknowledge the important lessons learned in other medical marijuana states, which provides excellent roadmaps for us that should be used by the Oklahoma Board of Health to construct its own rules and procedures. Other states have been doing this for decades now, and in that time have developed some best practices. Our recommendations are tied directly to what other states are doing and based on our united medical knowledge understanding and expertise. While the Oklahoma State Department of Health has made great strides in drafting rules in a very short period of time, we think there is more that can be done to protect the public health while implementing this new law. So today we bring forth three principles three recommendations that we believe should be added to the proposed rules to protect the public health and to ensure medical safety here among Oklahomans. So today, the first would be control the administration of this product to forms that are easily measured in doses, same as with any other medicine recommended by a licensed physician. This would include certain edibles, oils, and sublingual delivery methods, but no smokable products, just as in other states are already doing. Smoking of any kind is unhealthy. The evidence remains irrefutable. We have worked too hard here in Oklahoma thus far on lung health care on our patient population. Oklahomans expect us to protect them. This issue is not an option and really is more of an absolute demand. Made by us on behalf of all Oklahomans. Second of all, require pharmacists to be on the in the dispensaries as part of the approval process. As it has been stated many times, this is medicinal. Why would we treat this drug different from any other that is recommended by a physician. Number three, limit the initial number of dispensaries and locations as requested by cannabis industry. The majority of Oklahomans do not want dispensaries on every corner or strip mall. Instead, rules governing dispensaries should be consistent with how the health department already addresses other medical services. By limiting the number and location of treatment beds and other medical services based on public need. 
At this time, I would like to now welcome Dr. Leroy Young from the Oklahoma Osteopathic Association for additional comments. Go, sir. Thank you, Doctor. Leroy Young representing the Oklahoma Osteopathic Association. <clears throat> it is our consensus that medical marijuana products should not be sold in a smokable form, such as dry leaf or whole flyers, etc. In these forms, the product contains hundreds of unknown active chemicals, all of which can pose health hazards to both the smokers and those around them. In addition, it can be difficult to develop accurate and consistent doses of smokable products since there are varying sizes of joints, <laughs> types of vaporizer, and almost 800 known strains of marijuana. Oklahoma has fought a hard-won battle to curb tobacco use. In fact, the state currently spends about $1.6 billion a year on smoking-related health care cost. All smoking, regardless of whether or not it is in tobacco, marijuana, or other products, is hazardous and potentially cancer-causing. We can't afford to go backwards and relearn the same lessons from medical marijuana. Other states, such as New York, Pennsylvania, and Minnesota, disallow smoking in favor of safer and more reliable methods of dosing for patients, like pills, creams, and oils. Medical products, such as sublingual tinctures, are fast-acting and are not smoked. We can protect the children and non-smokers from secondhand smoke. Many Oklahomans live in multi-housing environments and may be at increased risk for exposure to drifting and offensive marijuana smoke. Over 100 toxins are released when cannabis is burned. Oklahoma should protect the public in shared spaces. Smoke is still smoke. Good afternoon. I'm Chelsea Church and I am the Executive Director of the Board of Pharmacy. Pharmacists need to be involved with this from the very beginning. We have a very regulated process here in the state. We hold, we hold our pharmacies extremely high to standards. We want to be sure that those same standards would be used in a dispensary, having a pharmacist in charge, to make sure that all the data is there. We, we need to protect the, pay, the public uh, by counseling the patients, drug interactions. Uh, we just need to treat it as a medicine, as in any other medicines that we have. And a pharmacist is who you get those from. I would like to introduce my board member, Justin Wilson, for a few comments, please. As Chelsea said, I'm Justin Wilson. I'm on the Board of Pharmacy, but I'm also a practicing community pharmacist in Midwest City, Oklahoma. As she said, I think pharmacists are involved every day with helping patients take their medications properly, uh, and working with their physicians, achieving the best healthcare care outcomes. But we're also there to make sure that we're looking for potential drug therapy problems. We're not exactly sure how marijuana is going to interact with their other medications, but you have to have a healthcare care professional at least involved at some point to help um, the patients take it as safely as possible. On the flip side, we're also very involved with preventing diversion, controlling our inventories, and reporting issues to the proper regulatory authorities. So I think pharmacists are um, a great resource as we move forward with implementation. Craig Jones. Thank you. My name is Craig Jones. I'm president of the Oklahoma Hospital Association. As you have heard, as important as this issue is to Oklahoma, we want to get it right. And there are many other states that have preceded this action that Oklahoma has taken, and we ought to avail ourselves as much as we can of the evidence that has preceded us. There are many states that have taken the position 
that they are limiting the number of marijuana dispensaries. And why is that? Well, one of the most leading reasons comes from the U.S. National Institutes of Health, a study, a study that they did that investigated the association between increased hospitalizations associated with marijuana abuse or dependency and the density of marijuana dispensaries. They studied California, which was the very first state to legalize marijuana, between the years 2001 and 2012. And what they found was is that for every additional dispensary per square mile in a zip code, there was a 6.8% increase in the number of marijuana-related hospitalizations. That's a situation that we certainly don't want to replicate here in Oklahoma. There's also other studies that are out there that show that the proliferation of dispensaries produce a greater risk that lead to dangerous practices. If there are unprofitable entities out there because of the proliferation of the number of dispensaries, there's more likelihood that they could sell or divert the product to either the black market, to markets that are not legal, or out of state to states that do not uh, have the policy that Oklahoma has. According to the Marijuana Policy Group, which is based in uh, Denver, Colorado, and has actually advised states across the country, both from an economic standpoint as well as an environmental condition standpoint, there are optimum levels of the number of dispensaries per population, per patient, or whatever. Some states, even larger than Oklahoma, have uh, selected the number of dispensaries arbitrarily at 50, 20, whatever it is. But this particular group has cited the statistic that there should be one dispensary for every 67,222 people. What that means is, from an optimum standpoint, it has to do with the level of dispensaries that creates a, a market that is profitable and doesn't create a proliferation that then generates these dangerous practices that otherwise uh, could happen, regardless of what method is used. It's clear that the Oklahoma State Department of Health needs to establish some type of a logical process by which it determines the number of dispensaries that are appropriate for Oklahoma to meet the community need and to meet the community conditions across our state. That's in essence what we feel is essential, is that we believe that other states have proven that there is a need to control the number of dispensaries so that the need is met, but we don't create unwarranted and unwanted conditions otherwise. Thank you. Dr. Beeman. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Jason Beeman. I am an addiction medicine physician with Oklahoma State University Center for Wellness and Recovery. And I'm here to highlight the importance of implementing the recommendations from the group here today. Uh, cannabis is not a benign substance. If we're going to use it for medical reasons, then we have to be very cautious. And always as physicians, we recognize the risk of the treatment combined with the benefits. And so I'm here to talk just a, briefly about some of the risk with the substance today. <clears throat> when we talk about marijuana, I really think that we need to separate it into two categories. The first being the acute intoxication phase. That when individuals are utilizing the substance, that they have an immediate intoxicating effect. Those effects can include impairing their coordination and balance, which is very important for such things as driving a car and operating machinery at work. It can also impair their different cognitive domains like memory and executive function. Uh, Decision-making ability can be impaired. It can also alter their mood. Some individuals experience an extreme increase in anxiety, even to the point where they have paranoid psychosis. And to that point, it's been correlated and demonstrated many, many, many times that marijuana use has a negative influence on schizophrenia. And I think we have to be very aware of that as we go forward into the future. And then on the other arm, besides the acute intoxication effect, is the addicting effects of marijuana. It is a substance that you can become addictive to. It releases chemicals in the brain that activate the reward circuit. That's why it's so highly abused as an illicit substance. 
And it's a, a marijuana addiction is a condition I can diagnose and I have diagnosed. It's also a condition that needs to be treated. So as more individuals have access to this substance, then we really need to be focused on the uh, consequences of that, that other individuals will need and more individuals will need treatment for uh, addiction and substance abuse related issues. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Bush, want to wrap up? Good afternoon. My name is Brian Bush. I'm the chair, chairman of the board for the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. I also serve as the CEO of the Altus Chamber of Commerce and in that way represent the business community in this discussion. And I want to start by thanking uh, all of our friends that are up here at the front today because I think it sends an incredibly strong message when you see this many health professionals and health organizations that are coming together on, on, on the same issue. And so I think it's very important to note that and, and, and say thank you uh, to all of them for taking the time to be here with us today. Um, in this room are the medical professionals and organizations that will be responsible uh, for implementing medical marijuana and dealing with its consequences. Uh, their recommendations must be heard and must be implemented. The state question was clear that the Oklahoma State Department of Health would be responsible for promulgating administrative rules to implement medical marijuana in Oklahoma. The crafters of the question could have chosen any agency, but they chose and they picked and the people voted for public health to oversee this process and that sends a very clear message about the intent of the voters and how important it is that the protection of public health be at the forefront of everything being done to implement these rules. The recommendations outlined here today are crucial to that end. To ignore the inclusion of these priority needs, uh, to ignore these medical professionals, and to ignore the experience of other states uh, would set our state up for terrible consequences. While I understand the process is difficult, it must be done right. As the chairperson of a board overseeing operations at a sister state healthcare agency, I understand the magnitude of the decisions at hand. That's why I'm here. That's why these health professionals are here. Uh, that's why we offer our support and we say that we stand with you in making the right decision for all Oklahomans, for all Oklahoma families seeking treatment for their loved ones, uh, for all of our Oklahoma communities, and for our state as a whole. To my counterpart, at the OSDH board, we call on you and we stand with you in protecting the health and well-being of all Oklahomans by ensuring that we limit the number of dispensaries, that the critical role of pharmacists are required in dispensaries, and most importantly, that we do not go backwards as a state by dispensing smokable products or encouraging smokers smoking in any way. The Oklahoma voters have made it clear that they want medical mar marijuana in our state, but they've also made it clear that they want it done right. It's critical that we do it right, and these recommendations are a huge step in that direction. Thank you again. Questions? Does this fly in the face of the will of people if you're trying to not include smokable medical marijuana? Does it say again? Does it fly in the face of the will of the voters since 57% voted in favor of this? Don't you, know, don't you think they knew what they were voting for? Great question. I'm sure you've read 788. We all have. And it doesn't specifically talk about smokables per se, but it does speak to it. You're correct in the, in that uh, the home um, aspects of uh, growing and what you can have at home and what that you can grow it at home. What you do in your home stays in your home, and it's so it's it's. I think that's how I would interpret that as, as just as a, as an individual. Um, to fly in the face of people, though, it, it's really silent to that. And the Department of Health here in Oklahoma, their mission is. Um, to protect Oklahomans. In fact, Oklahomans expect and demand it, and they have to have it. And as we go through on this, there's definitely legal leeway for that, uh, that interpretation uh, of that. Um, uh, 788 uh, doesn't specifically speak to that, other than the way I'm, I'm saying. Anybody else comment from the group? I would just point out, my name is Chuck Lester. Sorry. You come on up here. Yeah. Chuck Lester, Oklahoma Behavioral Health Association. We represent treatment, uh, prevention, and recovery in the state. There's no medical advantage to smoking. So if the people voted for medical marijuana, this is in fact giving them exactly what they have asked for. The chance for people who may need it to treat themselves and whatever conditions, legitimate conditions they have, while also trying to balance that with the public health aspect of it. Because the smoking piece is where the psychoactive compound is activated. It's how people get high. The other compounds within the plant, the ones that have shown any promise at all, 
don't have to be smoked to treat the legitimate issues that somebody may have. So I don't feel that this flies in the face of the voters. If anything, it reinforces what the voters have asked for, and that's medical marijuana. The Department of Health has released their updated final version of that draft, I guess, last night. The recommendations you just brought, the three specifically you brought up, were those presented to them during the comment period? Yes. What, did they, what was the response to you? Um, you presented them to them. Let, let, let me just say that it's my understanding they had over 11,000 comments, including from associations. So um, I couldn't begin to say that they commented back to all 11,000. I represent the Oklahoma State Medical Association, and I personally met with Commissioner Bates uh, as well as on the phone and several of the Department of Health uh, board members I've been speaking with as well to understand those very questions. They're very important questions. Um, but they... Um, they did not respond to the smokables. They were they were concerned about it, and I'm still encouraging that. It's no excuse. It's no excuse because um, the patients here who are in need of medical marijuana, and we recognize that, uh, you can get excellent excellent care without the smokables. And let's not go backwards. We have fought so hard uh, in in our state against uh, tobacco and its incredibly harmful effects. So none of those three recommendations are included in, in their final recommendations that are presented to the board, correct? Correct. And uh, you met with Commissioner Bates. Why did he tell you they didn't include them? Because you had one of um, Well, we didn't, uh, we haven't, uh, these just came out yesterday. I saw them myself, I think, 2 o'clock or so yesterday. But I didn't call him yesterday. But I assume you met with him before and you expressed your concerns about these three issues. Yes. Correct? Yes. And so what, what was, what, what were his responses? I, th I think his concern was uh, legal, their legal opinion that they had received. And we have since, uh, just to respond to that, we have since, uh, as a cohort here, looked at legal opinion. And we know that we, we actually have studied very hard the other states, I'm sure he has too, that have uh, medical marijuana laws which remove smokables and vapors, uh, vape. And, um, uh, legally, uh, we are of the opinion he absolutely can do that, and the Department of Health board members absolutely can make the right decision. Uh, we are physicians at the end of the day, and we compassionately care for the health of our patients, and no nothing overrides that. But nothing. Have pharmacists are a legal concern too? Because you had three recommendations. Pharmacists were yes, we had three recommendations. Yes, ma'am. Okay. The health department told me earlier they probably wouldn't comment specifically today since they have to present it tomorrow, but a spokesperson did text me earlier that you know people just need to keep in mind that these emergency rules and action taken tomorrow won't be the end of ongoing consideration. Moving forward, do you have any meetings planned, uh, set up with Commissioner Bates or anyone else from the health department? Well, there's a lot of people in the room, and, and I, I can't speak for them, but, but I can say that we have been uh, speaking with them, and I plan on talking with several of the board members. He actually works for the board. So I talk to the board members more than I talk to him. But, um, but it, it's important we have those conversations. And, and he's aware. I, I really believe he's aware. Uh, but he, uh, as I understood it, at least last week, um, that he, uh, he was concerned about the legal aspects. And we have since uh, retrieved good legal opinion. And so there is legal precedence to proceed. So, yes. So to be clear, are you planning to continue? You're planning to continue working through the health department's rulemaking process. You're not necessarily seeking legislative action on these three issues. No, I didn't say that. We will do that if we okay. if we need to. I'm sure we'll need to. We expect to do that. But we need to get this right, don't we? From from now, we don't want to go out and have. Uh, right across the street here, uh, 10, uh, you know, dispensaries, right? Right? And then if you looked at those and you read the, the very detailed uh, information on all of the harmful amounts of pesticides that can't be, you have to be a junior chemist. That's why we need the pharmacist, okay? And then number three, we have worked too hard to stop um, and, and really what you do in your own home as far as uh, smoking, medical marijuana, is your choice. But why should we as a state, we shouldn't, uh, allow that to go out of a dispensary and promote it in such a way when we have worked so hard um, to create a healthier Oklahoma? 
uh, makes no sense. And, and so that issue for me personally is not negotiable. You yes. Say people who say your organization, the pharmacists, even the chambers of commerce, all oppose medical marijuana be to begin with. No, sir, no, we no, didn't. No, not Absolutely not. I'm not sure where you got that the, from. The OSMA didn't come out and no, the we've AMA. never done that. In fact, no, very explicitly, right. no, we opposed 788, right. not medical marijuana. We actually said that every time carefully because we don't. We're physicians. We're compassionate. We know and recognize patients need that. So but you oppose this proposal, and so doesn't that affect your? This is why we opposed it because things like this. It was written too broadly. It was actually more, in my personal opinion, a recreational marijuana bill, because it didn't uh, accurately cover these issues. For example, if they had. Uh, they, they kept telling us that we would just do a legislative session. Well, we all know that's not happening, and we know why, right? So, so that's not going to happen right what now. What is your opinion on why that's not happening? Why the governor didn't call a special session? Because why? everyone's up for re-election. Mm -hmm. Who wants to be known as the person that went against the will of the people, correct? Right. So I'm still not clear. Are we proposing separate rules for homegrown marijuana, homegrown medical marijuana then? No, sir. What you do in your home is your business. We're simply asking that smokables and vapes be removed from the dispensaries. And have you come up with the written proposals that you intend to submit? To the we have submitted them. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. Are there other states that have pharmac pharmacists in dispensaries? Yes, sir. Which ones? Um, okay. Can you tell me? Yeah, pharmacy. Connecticut. Minnesota. Um, there are several other states that have pharmacists that are consultants that may be not there every minute of the day, but a consultant in the majority of the states, a pharmacist has role for counseling for looking at drug interactions. Any other questions? Come on. <laughs> Can we help you with anything else? Are you considering any sort of legal action that stopped implementation? Um, I can't say that we wouldn't. Uh, we feel passionate about this issue of not dispensing smokables at all. Again, what you do in your own home is your business. So, Doctor, are you worried about any kind of backlash for some of these limitations or recommendations specifically on removing smokable medical marijuana from these rules? No, sir, not at all. I have carefully, in fact, everybody in here has, and others, many others, have carefully studied other states. That's really where we gathered our understanding, because you can learn a lot. These states have been doing this, several of them, for decades. And uh, they've had to really make a lot of changes. And why don't we step off the curb right and do it well? In fact, do it better, right? Are you concerned at all that you might be promoting a black market if you put these kind of limits on smokables and on dispensaries? Absolutely not. Like I said, how did I say it? You can still do whatever you want in your own home. There is a way for that to happen. But to do that out of a dispensary is just wrong. Wrong. Do any other states ban smokables? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Are you concerned about quality control? Because at least through the, the dispensary process, states can control pesticide use, things of that nature. If people are growing it at home, they can't do that. Correct. We know that. And they know that. The THC limit in the, um, in the regulations. And I wondered if you were familiar if there was any literature on whether that um, there was anything that 12 percent limit was based on that you were aware of? Well, yes, there's the THC content has been extensively studied and we know that uh, the higher the THC content, uh, the more likely you are to activate and uh, reinforce that reward center in your brain and uh, lead to higher use and, and a higher likelihood of addiction. Also, the higher the content, the more likely all of the bad things that we get. And it's important to recognize that the marijuana that individuals are smoking today is not what they were smoking in the 1960s. That uh, through genetic redefining of the more potent strains, we are now up to 
uh, somewhere around, I want to say, 40 or 50 percent higher in THC content than even where we were a few years ago, and definitely much, much higher than where we were in the 60s. The higher the THC content, the more likely you are to develop psychosis, uh, acute psychosis, or to trigger uh, an underlying schizophrenia. So that THC content is really, really important uh, to define and to limit as we go forward. Do you think the public knew what they were voting on when they approved 788? No. So are you asking the Board of Health tomorrow to, to, to not approve any of these rules, or are you wanting to... No, ma'am. We have three points. Yeah, but, but you're okay with them approving what, what's existing, you just want them to add... These We've numbers? seen the, the draft, just like I'm sure most of you have, and uh, there's some few things we can have discussions, just mild cleanup, all right? Um, and I'll be having that discussion with them, and I'm sure everyone around here will be doing their own discussions with them as well small things but these three things are big issues and um, at the end of the day we have to pay attention and focus on the health of Oklahomans they expect it they really expect it they expect it from physicians they expect it from the Board of Health here in Oklahoma they really expect it and they need it so this is something that you go back and add or you want to delay the implementation of the rules um, the I'm not commenting either way I'm just saying we need to, to work on it can I make a comment? Yes, sir. Please. You know, it, it bothers me that, that there is a sense that this group up here is against medical marijuana. And I think we've indicated that that's not the case. But let's not lose sight of the fact that 788 cited the term medical marijuana 43 times. And what you have before you is a group of individuals representing the medical community that want to give the state of Oklahoma, to give the people who are interested in having this therapy, the right kind of medical marijuana. So to feel as if we are trying to limit this, that we're trying to prevent this from happening, is ludicrous. The point is, is that we need to do it correctly. And whatever happens tomorrow is not going to be the last point of this. We will continue to work we will continue to be supportive of the legislature, of the State Department of Health, to make certain that what we do in Oklahoma, as the doctor indicated, is even better than what has happened in other states. That really is the message that ought to be conveyed here, is that we want to do it right and to be in compliance with what State Question 788 said. We want to do medical marijuana. Yes, well said. Anybody else? Any more uh, media? Dr. Hosher, could, could you just yes. expand? You, you said you didn't think that the people knew what they were voting on. What specifically do you think they, voters weren't aware of? I am a practicing ophthalmologist in Lawton, Oklahoma. I'm in a rural community. And my community, as I understand it from the voting takeout, was one of the high people, high, high places that voted for State Question 788. Commonly, I had patients come in and ask me, commonly, what should they do? Uh, they had no real understanding. They assumed, sir, that because it said medical, that somehow people like myself, physicians, were somehow involved in that. We weren't. And I tell them that. I would tell them we had nothing to do with that. So I feel like it was presented with the word medical as a sham, um, in, in, in that physicians really weren't involved in, in that process. Uh, nobody in here certainly was, or our organizations. Um, we would have uh, enjoyed doing that. And again, we are not against medical marijuana. It's the state question that was the problem, and that's why we're here today. There are still gaps, and we need to correct those gaps now because this goes starts in 30 days, right? Less than 30 days. So um, the, the issue at hand is we need to put the right foot forward on very important issues, which we've outlined today. It's given you as three. That's Are all you we're optimistic asking. Optimistic that can happen. Absolutely, I'm not optimistic. I know it can happen. Mm -hmm. I know it can happen. Absolutely. Even with the short timeline. We wouldn't be here today if we didn't know it could happen. 